خصوصا على افضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الامين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وبع we begin with allah's blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam and we pray for blessings on this home and our brother muhammad ali abu bakar who in his generosity and love for islam Uh, he and his family have invited us to their gracious home so that we can share an evening together on this important topic may allah bless this home and bless those who reside in this home and protect this home from all evil and from all harm i mean in villa bistari yes. villa bistari in gumbak in kuala lumpur in malaysia And our topic is one that is you are familiar with. I have spoken on this subject several times. I've even written a booklet which is outside on the topic the golden hour and silver dirham Islam and the future of money. We begin by asking the question what is money? what is money in islam imagine the dune your grave and the questioning begins and you are expecting only three questions but no it's not like that the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said that the test and the trials of the grave would be as great as the tests and trials of al masih al dajjal so to believe that there are only three questions in the grave and that's it is not correct and the angel would to ask you what is money what is money and you say to the angel but you're not supposed to ask that question in the grave huh <laughs> what is money So let us attempt to answer the question using the Quran and using the Sunnah of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And we usually begin with this event in which Bilal radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and listen carefully eh, because I'm surprised at the number of people who still don't understand after I have explained Maybe I'm not a good teacher. Bilal radiyallahu ta'ala anhu once came to the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, and offered him some dates. He looked at the dates and he said, Bilal, these are very high quality dates. Where did you get them? Bilal said, O Messenger of Allah, I had two dates. Uh, using today's measurement of weight, two kilograms, at that time it was a saw, I had two kilograms of inferior quality dates. Maybe they were worth about 25 ringgits each. Oh, sorry. Maybe they were worth three dirhams each. And... Uh, I exchanged them for this one kilogram of superior quality dates which has the same value as the two kilogram. It was not an unfair exchange, no. The value of the two kilograms of inferior quality dates was the same as the value of the one kilogram of superior quality dates. It was not an unfair exchange at all. Bilal said the prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam this is the essence of riba now that's terrible 
Riba, when you are in Riba, Allah wages his war against you. Huh. If you're still taking the interest on the loan, for example, Allah wages war on you. Hmm? Bilal, this is the essence of riba. An unequal exchange of dates was riba. Bilal, what you should have done was to sell the two kilograms and take that money and buy the one kilogram. That would be halal. No riba. <coughs> but uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhum exchanged one camel for four camels. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu exchanged one camel for twenty. An unequal exchange of camels was not haram was not riba no but an unequal exchange of dates was riba and the question that we ask is why 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 a hundred years ago even a schoolboy would be able to answer that question today even the darul ulum zakaria in johannesburg in South Africa with 700 students from 70 different countries and all the staff and the principal present and none of them could answer the question. Knowledge has fled. <laughs> the answer to the question resides in another hadith which is at the heart of our subject. The Prophet said, if an exchange is that of gold for gold, this one was dates for dates and that one was camels for camels. If an exchange, sorry, if a transaction involves an exchange of gold, of gold for gold or silver for silver, or wheat for wheat, or barley for barley, or dates for dates, there we are, we got the dates now, or salt for salt. It must be an equal exchange. And it must be a spot exchange, on the spot. Cannot be a credit transaction. If it is not an equal exchange, meaning if you have two kilograms on this side, you must also have two on this side. If it is not an equal exchange, and if it is not a spot exchange, if it is a credit transaction, then that is riba, said the Prophet Why? We have to now go and look at these six different items. Two of them are precious metals and the other four are commodities of food consumption which are in abundant supply in the market and which have a shelf life. Hmm? What is there that is common to all six? And the answer is that all six were used as money. As money. Gold coins were used as money. Silver coins were used as money. And when there was a shortage of gold and silver coins in the market, then in Medina they would use dates as money. Obviously, 
You could only use dates as money for microtransactions. Can't buy this house with dates. <laughs> so wheat, barley, dates and salt were used as money. There are some people who are going to be offended about this. And they would want to quarrel with the Prophet You see these people have more knowledge than the Prophet. How, why are you using dates as money? How archaic, how backward. <laughs> Leave them in their ignorance. Don't bother to argue with such people. Don't, just leave them and move. So let's get back to our subject and get rid of these people. Cumbersome people. So now we know that money in Islam, money in Islam is either precious metals, gold and silver, or commodities of food consumption, which are in abundant supply in the market, which have a shelf life. And so if you are in the the Indonesian island of Java and you are you are in your market and you want to use the Sunna money in your market and there is a shortage of gold and silver coins you would use rice as money in that market and if you were in the Caribbean island of Cuba and of course you are all aware that Fidel Castro no longer smokes cigars eh? and you want to restore the Sunna money you would use not tobacco no no you would use sugar as money forget about these people who sneer at you and laugh at you and say that is so backward we don't want to hear your voice get out get out we don't want you in our company how do we proceed from here? In addition to this being money in the Quran and sorry in the Sunnah, we know something else about it. That in every instance, the money which is in the Sunnah is money which has value which resides in the money. That value can fluctuate we are not dumb dumbs you don't have to lecture to us that value can fluctuate of course but at all times the value resides in the money not in some bank in lower Manhattan no and thirdly the value of the money is a value bestowed to it by Allah who alone creates wealth from nothing. We have, in several instances in the last two, three weeks that I have been here, we have said that Allah is Al Khalik, the one who creates. That He is more than that, He is Al Fatir, the one who originates from point of origin. Fatir, Fataras Samawati Wal Al, the originator of the Samawat and the Al. And that he is more than that. He is Badiyo Samawati Wal Al. Only he creates from nothing. So if you attempt to create from nothing and play God, I pity you when you go down in the grave. I pity you when you are in the grave. Now then, this is money in Islam, in the Sunnah. And when we leave the Sunnah and we go to the Quran to look at money in the Quran, what do we find? In uh, Surah to Surah to Ali Imran, is it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the curious conduct of the Jews. Women Ahlil Kitab. And amongst them, there are those in ta'amanhu bikintar, if you entrust with him a treasure of gold, 
enough to buy this house. You addihi, like when you want back your money, he gives it back to you. وَمِنْهُ مَنْ إِنْتَأَمَنْهُ بِدِينَارِ But amongst them there are those if you were to entrust him with a dinar. لَا يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكْ He would not return it to you. What's wrong? In what way am I different from him? I mean you return his, you return his kintar, you wouldn't return my dinar. إِلَّا مَا دُمْتَ عَلَيْهِ قَائِمًا The only way you can get back your dinar is if you stand there pounding and demanding it back. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا Ah, now we get the reason. The reason for this double standard is because قَالُوا لَيْسَ عَلَيْنَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ السَّبِيلِ We have no moral obligations to these cockroaches. They are an inferior, <laughs> inferior class of human beings. We are the chosen of the Lord. Heaven is reserved for us. So in our eyes they are like cockroaches. So we can rip them off. But they tell a lie against Allah. They tell a lie against Allah that they have no moral obligations to those who are Ummiyun, Ummiyun the Gentile, who are not Jews. And they do it knowingly. In this verse of the Quran, um, I'm so tired I can't remember if it is Surah to, Surah to Ali Imran. I believe it is. If I make a mistake, all of you too will know it's a mistake. In this verse of the Quran, Allah speaks about the dinar. The dinar. And the dinar in the Quran is not made of paper. <laughs> it's a gold coin. Hmm? And then in Surah to Yusuf, the little boy Yusuf alayhi salam was put down into the well. And then the travelers came and they fished him out. And they took him to Misr which is not the whole of Egypt. Today, Misr is the whole of Egypt. But at that time, Misr was that part of Egypt where the Jews used to live. The eastern delta, from the river Nile to the river Euphrates. Hmm? And they sold him for a few measly dirhams and they did this because they considered him to be a thing of little value hmm? so in this verse of the Quran Allah uses the word dirham and he uses it in the context of buying and selling and so and of course this dirham is not made of paper <laughs> it's a silver coin and so we now have the astonishing, astonishing news. Astonishing for those fellows out there who are grunting and grinding their teeth. Astonishing news that money in the Quran is gold dinar and silver dirham. That is in the Quran. You, it's a bit late in the day to attempt to change the Quran now. Money has uh, therefore been identified. So then now why was it haram and riba to have the exchange of dates which was unequal? And why was it halal you could have an unequal exchange of, of, uh, of durians? No problem. Answer? Because dates were used as money in that market. That is why it had to be prohibited. Since dates were used as money, if you permitted an unwe unequal exchange of dates, I give you one kilo, you give me two. I give you one thousand dinars, you give me two thousand dinars. That's the money lender. 
lending money on interest. <laughs> so you had to prevent the money lender. And this is why he said this is the essence of riba. But halal, you could have an unequal exchange of, uh, of camels. Why? Why? You work for a whole month and you get your salary and your salary is a nice goat and you're taking the, the goat home and the goat fell long in a ditch and died. So when you reach home, your wife asks for the salary. You tell your wife, salary died. <laughs> so, wife said, go and tell the boss. So you go to the boss and you say, boss, salary died. And the boss said, but when I gave you salary, salary was alive. <laughs> Since animals Animals can fall ill, animals can die, fruits can rot, mangoes can rot, durians can spoil. These cannot be used as money. And so it was perfectly halal to have an unequal exchange of camels. But it was haram to have an unequal exchange of dates. The other thing about this uh, um, hadith about gold for gold, silver for silver, etc. is that the Prophet said it must be hand to hand. If it is not hand to hand, it is riba. Meaning that Islam prohibits a financial transaction which is a credit transaction in which there is an exchange of money which of the same money that I give you this much money and you return this much more of the same money after some time credit haram not permitted because the prophet said it must be hand to hand it has to be a spot exchange it cannot be a credit transaction money has a number of different functions one of them is to be the medium of exchange for buying and selling and if you say well it's not that convenient to walk around with gold and silver coins and so on well, we'll say to you, it's also not that convenient to live in the hellfire. <laughs> if convenience is what you're after. <laughs> Money also has other functions to perform. And that is that it is money which determines value, a measure of value. The Indonesian daughter that I have, and you also have, she's your daughter as well. She's not only my daughter. And sometimes when you think about her, you must only cry. The Indonesian daughter <coughs> works in Singapore for 300 Singapore dollars a month. Is that a wage acceptable with Allah. Well, would any Singaporean girl work for that wage, doing that work? The answer is no. For you to come and tell me, well, when she takes that wage to, sing, to Indonesia, she can build a mansion with it. I'll throw you out of the house. Get out, I don't want to see you. But that rubbish, that's rubbish. The market has to be respected. The market must not only be a free market, it must be a fair market. And we are talking about the market in which she is working. Not another market where she's building a house. We're talking about the market where she is working in this market. 
is this a fair wage? The answer is no. No Singaporean girl would work for that wage. Well then how come we reach here? Because the money that is being used to measure value is saying one thing in Indonesia and saying another thing in Singapore and singing yet another th tune in Manhattan. Hmm? No. Money must function as a measure of value. And so whether it is a maid working as a domestic server or whether it is someone employed in your restaurant working as a laborer or someone working in construction huh? and you import labor you import labor from those parts of the world where people have been reduced to miserable poverty and destitution and you use this scam labor <laughs> to build and to run your restaurants and to run your homes you are an oppressor and you're doing this oppression and you're getting away with it because your money is failing to function as a measure of value and Allah has zero tolerance for oppression it is as certain as the sun rising from the east that Allah will destroy you. You just have to wait for that destruction to come. Money also has a third function. And that is to, to be a store of value. You, my grandfather, my grandfather died in 1971. Maybe your grandfather died in 1971. And left you some money. Hmm? and uh, gave orders that you should only receive that money when you grow up and you are capable of using it you're an adult it was a hundred dinars so they put the money away and locked it up we expect that since the 100 dinars can buy can buy 10 camels hmm? And camels that 25 years later 30 years later when the money is given to you demand and supply remaining constant the money that your grandfather left for you should still be able to buy the 10 camels because the the money has stored the value this is money in Islam. And we now have two questions to answer. For those who are minting gold coins in Kalantan, and minting gold coins in Pira, and minting gold dinars in, in Dubai and so on, and, uh, and uh, convincing us that they are on the path of Islam, mashallah, we have two questions to ask. Question number one. Well, since all of mankind was using this money for thousands of years, thousands of years, how did this money disappear from the market? Who, who took the money out of the market? Question one. Question two, why did they take it out of the market? We want an answer. Don't just mint the dinar and sell it and make a profit. Come on, answer the question. Question three, what did they replace the dinar and dirham with? And has this replacement functioned successfully? as a medium of exchange, as a measure of value, and as a store of value. And one more question. We want to know why are they 
those people who took the dinar and dirham out of the market, why are they bringing it back? Because we know that they're bringing it back. Even while we are holding on to something else, 20 years from now, 25 years from now, their monetary system is going to be gold and silver coins. We know that. I don't know whether the International Islamic University knows it, but we know it. So we want answers for these questions. And we are arguing that only that branch of knowledge which is called eschatology, the study of Akhil zaman only this branch of knowledge can give the answers. Akhil zaman but those fellows who are minting the gold and silver coins, they run from this subject. They hide behind the trees when we talk about this subject. They block their ears when we talk about this subject. They get scared when we talk about this subject. I don't know why they don't go and buy a one-way ticket to Disneyland. Yeah, that's what they should do. The answers are, In the Quran, Allah identified them in the Quran. And we have quoted this verse several times already, identifying who are those responsible for taking the gold and silver coins out of the market. Allah says in the Quran, لا تتخذ اليهود والنصارى أولياء بعضهم أولياء بعض ومن يتولهم منكم فإنه منهم إن الله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين our problem is that we don't read the Quran. Oh no. We will spend, we will spend every day the amount of time we need to read the New Straits Times. And listen to the news on CNN. But we treat the Quran with contempt. We find it degrading and disgusting to go to the Quran to find answers to the problems of modern life. That the Quran should explain to us the reality of the world today. Well then what are we going to do with our university education? The secular university education told us that religion is for the birds. <laughs> the Quran is what you read for the dead. You don't read Quran for the living. Eh? Don't take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies. Not all Jews. Not all Christians. No, no, no. Such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other. The Quran is telling us that a time is going to come when a mysterious reconciliation will take place between part of the Christian world and part of the Jewish world. And when that reconciliation takes place, it's going to lead to friendship and an alliance, a Judeo-Christian alliance. When that happens, do not, do not, do not go underneath the umbrella <laughs> because if you do that you will belong to them you're no longer a Muslim so when you die and you go down in the grave and according to the law of the country you are registered as a Muslim and when the angel comes in the grave and informs you you are not a Muslim you're going to start arguing with the angel Oh, but the law of Malaysia recognizes me as a Muslim. How can you say I'm not a Muslim? <laughs> it's going to be very funny down there in the grave. When they suddenly find, to their great astonishment, that they're not Muslims. They lost their Islam and they were not even aware of it. Because they had no time for the Quran. Hmm? That 
Judeo-Christian alliance has emerged in Europe and the bond that brought them together is Zionism. It is that Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance that we are prohibited from maintaining friendly ties with. But a Christian, a Christian who denounces the oppression of that alliance, denounces the oppression of Israel, a Christian whose heart beats for the oppressed and struggles to liberate the oppressed. Huh? There's a book written in French by what's his name? The Wretched of the Earth. Um, the what? Franz Fanon. The Wretched of the Earth. Hmm? From Guadeloupe in the Caribbean. But he wrote it in Paris. Christian. And yet so eloquently, eloquently, brilliantly describing the plight of the poor who are permanently poor and oppressed. A Christian. Are you going to say about that Christian? He can't be your friend and ally? Have you got peanuts in your head? Huh? A Jew, a Jew who opposes Israel, opposes this oppression. A Jew who wants to see the liberation of the Pali Palestinian people from oppression. Are you going to say to that Jew, you can't be our friend and ally? You got peanuts in your head? <laughs> no, the Quran is talking about these Christians and these Jews who come together in the Judeo-Christian alliance, the Zionist alliance, and whose trademark is oppression. In Allah la yahdil mean Oppression, they are oppressors. They're the ones who took the gold dinar out of the market and the silver dirham. They're the ones who brought modern Western civilization into being. They control power in modern Western civilization. They're the ones who colonized the Muslim world. And when they colonized the Muslim world, they did not decolonize until they had removed this money from the market and replaced it with their money. And what is their money? When you study international monetary economics, as I have been fortunate to study at two different universities, indeed I gave my teacher so much trouble at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, Professor Curzon, as a doctoral student. I was the only student in the class, but well, they were all white students, we were just a few brown and black. I gave him so much trouble that Professor Curzon called me aside one night. Mr. Hussein, you don't have to attend my class, you know. Just write the examination at the end of the year. Meaning, I don't want you in my class. Hmm? They removed the gold and silver money from the market and replaced it with their money. And when you study international monetary economics, you could see the trickery. You could see the trickery of how they move stage by stage until they reach now the stage where you just take a piece of paper, you print a paper, picture, you put a number, you say abracadabra and it becomes money. Yeah. But I have said many times I would suggest to you don't make the statement that I am making until you have studied the Bretton Woods Accord. You have studied the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund, which incidentally prohibit the use of gold as money. The Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund prohibit the use of gold as money. The money that they have substituted in the market 
is not only bogus and fraudulent and haram, but more than that. It is a money which functions as a riba. That part of riba, which can be described as a transaction based on deception, which is a profit or a gain to which one is not justly entitled. That's the elegant way of describing it. But the Americans have a pretty way of describing it. They call it a ripoff. Hmm? A ripoff. This paper currency is the biggest ripoff in human history since Adam alayhi salam set foot on earth. And Allah is not impressed with those who have eyes and yet cannot see. But I have a PhD from MIT. Huh? Yes. But you still have eyes and yet cannot see. You still cannot recognize that the paper currency is a rip-off. Huh? Allah is not oppressed by those who have eyes and yet cannot see ears and yet cannot hear, hearts and yet do not understand. Allah says, Ula'ika kal an'am, they're just like cattle. Balhu adal, rather they're more misguided than cattle. Ula'ika humul ghafilun. These are the ones who are truly negligent of Allah's laws. The Paper currencies were introduced to bring about a massive transfer of wealth that was unjust. Th th those who belonged to that Zionist alliance, they had a special chemical. So when they printed their paper money, paper currencies, they would dip the paper currency into that chemical and when it came out of the chemical it became hard currency you don't believe me it became, it became hard currency and it is only with the hard currency that you can now buy and sell internationally you're buying from China and you in Malaysia the American dollar is so far away but for the Malaysian to buy from China, he got to pay in US dollar. Can't pay in Malaysian ringgit. Because Malaysia doesn't have the chemical to dip, to dip the paper, so it will come out as hard currency. You see? And, and anywhere you go in the world you're traveling, you have to carry hard currency with you. Huh? The traveler needs hard currency. And uh, for trade, international trade, you need hard currency. But they went one further than that. They made sure, made sure that their paper must rule the market. So they colluded with the oil exporting countries, OPEC, to ensure that OPEC insist that no oil can be bought except with US dollars. These traitors. The Saudis are the world's, the, the Muslim world's greatest traitors. The greatest punishment should be deserved for the Saudis who have the Haramein and the Hajj and yet submit that the oil can only be sold for the US dollar. You cannot pay for oil other than US dollars. Hmm? And yet the whole world of Islam, you go to Saudi Arabia, you perform Hajj, perform Umrah, you thank the Saudis, mashallah, mashallah, you made the place look like heaven. Yes, you cattle. 
Yes, you cattle. <laughs> you got peanuts in your head. Did you see Munker? So big is this monster of Munker. And yet not a word about it. You go perform the Hajj and come back. Not even the squeak of a mouse in protest. Hmm? So the US dollar has commanded the market. And before it, the sterling pound. Hmm? And all the other European countries. And because Australia is white, so the Australian dollar is also with that chemical hard currency. But Pakistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, eh? Indonesia. Eh? You take a suitcase filled with Bangladeshi taka. Suitcase. And you go to Midtown Manhattan, you want to buy one cup of coffee. And you offer the whole suitcase. And they refuse. They refuse. Because your paper money is not hard currency. Because this paper money is not sanctioned by the Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance. But Allah had commanded us, do not enter into an alliance with these people. So do not enter into the monetary system that comes from them. Do not do it. That is in the Quran. And if you do it, then you belong to them, not to us. So when you die and you go in your grave, you have a very unpleasant surprise waiting for you because you'd not be recognized as a Muslim. No. That is their monetary system. What about their political system? The modern secular state, which has membership in an organization known as the United Nations Organization, which has a security council and so on. Do not, do not, do not enter into that. The Quran is telling you. Because if you do, you will not be recognized as a Muslim. And yet what has happened? The whole world of Islam has entered into it. No wonder that the hadith is repeated four times in Sahih Bukhari. It is a hadith al-Qudsi, direct speech of Allah. But 999 out of every 1,000 of mankind will enter into the hellfire. No wonder. We see it. If you, if you do what they did, you take paper, you print a picture, you put a number, and you, you assign to that piece of paper an entirely fictitious value. You are attempting to create wealth out of nothing. Hmm? But only Allah is but the Yusamawati will all. Only Allah creates wealth from nothing. So the, melt, the money that we use is money that Allah has created. And Allah has given the value. But they create wealth out of nothing. And they assign the value. And they can manipulate that value. And as they attack your paper, and your paper begins to crumble, which is what the ringgit is doing now, but since you're living in the comfort zone, you're not aware of it. The last time I was here, four years ago, I bought a dinar for, I think, 96 ringgits. I understand it's no longer 96 ringgits? It is how much? Say it a little louder for me, please. Yeah. You hear that? That's, that is your, your ringgit losing value. As money loses value, there is a massive transfer of wealth from the innocent, unsuspecting masses to a global predatory elite, international and domestic. Those domestic, they ride on the gravy train. Oh, yes. 
and they rule the domestic economy on the jazz behalf. Hmm. In 1933, was it? There is a book outside entitled The Prohibition of Riba in the Quran and Sunnah. I mean, some of my books I know a little difficult to read. You need some Tylenol tablets. <laughs> I have one book you'll enjoy reading. It's a travelogue. Travelogue is very nice. To eat. You enjoy the travelogue. But the prohibition of riba in the Quran and Sunnah, you may take it up a few times before you read it. But I also have the gold dinar book letter. But in this book, I have given you the story of what happened in the United States in 1933, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. That the American government prohibited the use of gold as money. They demonetized gold. Prior to that, Gold coins were in the market. Hmm? They demonetized gold. It's no longer legal tender. They went one step further and they prohibited residents and citizens of keeping gold. You can keep jewelry, but you cannot keep gold coins and gold bullion. And they gave you a certain amount of time to get rid of it. Sell it to the government. And if you are caught with gold coins or gold bullion after that cutoff date, you'll be fined $10,000 and spend six months in jail eating uh, apple pie. <laughs> so, the American people, American people rush to sell their gold to Uncle Sam at 20 20 dollars an ounce. Uncle Sam printed the paper and gave them 20 dollars US greenbacks for every ounce of gold. And they trusted Uncle Sam because Uncle Sam was clever. He wrote on the dollar bill, in God we trust. <laughs> in God we trust, yeah. Uncle Sam was really clever. But the American people were so foolish. <laughs> the foolishness is existing up to this day. Up to this day. They can't see. After all the American people had sold their gold to Uncle Sam, the US government, and the Federal Reserve, really. Then in January 1934, perhaps, the Federal Reserve, which is a private bank, decided decided that the US dollar the US dollar will change in value go down in value like the ringgit and so now today it's called devaluation one ounce of gold you have to buy it with 35 US dollars not 20 anymore hmm? and then Uncle Sam the US government withdrew the prohibition of the use of gold as money and withdrew the prohibition of people keeping the gold and uh, whispered you better come and buy back your gold quickly before I change the price again so the American people rushed to buy back their gold at $35 an ounce of gold at the end of the day, after they had bought back the gold, Uncle Sam was left with 41% of the gold in his pocket. By this simple mechanism of changing the value of the money. He had ripped off the people of 41% of their wealth. That actually, in my opinion, that was a trial run. You know, if you buy a rifle, huh, before you go to hunt, 
you want to test it out. Mm -hmm. uh, shoot, testing. So, so this was the trial run in 1933-34 to see whether the system will work. Huh? And then after that they proceeded to attack and to reduce the value of every currency and then finally even the US dollar itself so that the American people will now lose their wealth again. The US dollar was 20 20 dollars for one ounce of gold at that time. Guess where it is today? About 1400? 1500? Look at that. It looks as though the US dollar is crumbling. Last thing I heard about it is what is it? In the ICU, the intensive care unit of the hospital. It's collapsing. And as the value of the money falls, there's a massive transfer of wealth from the unsuspecting innocent masses to a global predatory elite. What will Allah do? What will Allah do to the ulama of Islam who will allow this to happen? There's a hadith in the Sunan of Tirmizi I believe, narrated by Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, which should make the scholars of Islam terrified. The Prophet said, It will not be long before that time comes. When nothing will remain of Islam but the name. Masjid is there. Surah is there, hijab is there, cap is there, baju what? Baju, ma, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> All the external trappings of religion are there. Oh yes. But the religion has fled. It's only the external shell that is left now. Nothing will remain of Islam but the name. And nothing will remain of the Quran but the traces of the writing. Because nobody goes to the Quran. That the Quran could teach you what is money. Yeah. At that time, the masajid would be grand structures but devoid of guidance yesterday the masjid was built with mud walls and a thatched roof and when rain fell it used to leak yesterday but now they are multi-million dollar structures grand structures iron and steel <laughs> but devoid of guidance and now listen to the last part of the hadith ulama'uhum the ulama of that age of those people with the grand buildings of Masajid. Sharrun nasi mimman tahta adimis sama. They would be the worst people beneath the sky. The worst people beneath the sky. No wonder that nobody quotes this hadith. When last did you hear someone quoting this hadith? Eh? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody quotes this hadith, no? Ulama'uhum sharrun nasi mimman tahta adimis sama. The ulama of those people at that time will be the worst people beneath the sky. Min indihim takhrujul fitna wa fihim ta'ud, said the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. They will be the center of the fitna which corrupts and destroys the faith. Hmm? And so we live now in that age when this monstrous, this colossal betrayal of Islam has already taken place. The horse has already fled and now you want to close the stable door. <laughs> no. What do we do? It is not sufficient to simply mint 
the dinar and they hate me for saying this, I tell you this. They hate me for it. Why does Imran Hussein not go back to Trinidad? It is not sufficient to mint the dinar and dirham and beat your drums about it. No. <laughs> The Prophet said that when you see something which is munkar, you must change it with your hand. This paper currency is munkar. You're minting the dinar and dirham and bringing it into the market for people to buy it does not change the munkar. The munkar is still there. So your dinar and shaitan are sitting on the same sofa. And Shaitan is smiling all the time. I wonder why he's smiling. Shaitan is smiling because he knows that you can keep on minting the dinar. It does not change the situation that he is in command of the market. <laughs> huh? The Prophet said if you cannot change it with your hand, then change it with your tongue. Speak out against it. And if you cannot change it with your tongue, then at least with your heart. And that is the weakest form of faith. So what else, what can you do? We say, if you want to get rid of that bogus money, and replace it with the dinar and dirham, you have to create your own market. We say, you can't do it in KLCC. But you can try. You can try. We say, this is our opinion. And when we give our opinion, we are always pleased when people challenge it. Yes. If I'm wrong, you tell me what's your opinion. Maybe I benefit from your views. So we say, the best place to create our own micro market is in Kampong. You know the meaning of the word Kampong? And in the Kampong, you remove, you prohibit the use of this bogus money. And you bring back the gold and silver coins as money. They're going to come after you. They're going to come after you. The state of Utah in the United States is bringing back gold and silver coins as money. And after Utah, there may be other states in the United States and even in Britain and Europe. They can do it, but we can't. <laughs> That's not fair. That's not fair. At least we should make the effort. So that if we try and then they send us to Guantanamo, our own Muslim people will do it. Our own Muslim people will do that to us. Yeah. Because they're not Muslims anymore. They've joined that alliance. If we try and we fail, at least it will be recorded in our names that we made the effort to restore the dinar and dirham as money in our market by removing the bogus and fraudulent and haram money. And now comes the last part of the subject. Why are they bringing back the dinar and dirham, the gold and silver coins? Why? We have already explained it in several lectures. One more time and then we end. Israel wants to rule the world. Why? Political science can't tell you why. No. International relations can't tell you why. No. Only eschatology, the study of Akhir al-Zaman, will tell you why Israel wants to rule the world. Israel is already ruling the world from behind the hijab, controlling the United States. Hmm? <laughs> when Israel says to Obama, stand up, he got to stand up. Sit down, Obama, he has to sit down. Hmm? Israel wants to rule the world. Because there's someone created by Allah and programmed by Allah to impersonate the true Messiah and who therefore has to rule the world from Jerusalem in order to declare he is the Messiah. But he would not be the Messiah 
He would be the false messiah. He would be Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Dajjal, the false messiah. The Christians know about him. The Jews know about him. But the Jews believe that he is something else than what is now coming up. And of course Muslims know about him because the Prophet has spoken about him extensively. I believe it may not be more than 20-25 years before he stands up in Jerusalem and declares that I am the Messiah. Hmm? But no Jew will accept him as a Messiah if Israel is still using paper money or what is worse than paper money is electronic money. Money you can't see and money you can't touch. Hmm? Every Jew knows, every Jew knows that the prophets David and Solomon, Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam, that in day, at that time the temple minted its own coins because the temple did not recognize the Roman coin to be valid money because of the graven image, which is haram. And so Israel will have to bring back gold and silver coins as money in order for Dajjal to claim that he is the Messiah. And therefore Western civilization has to bring back gold and silver as money. Only, only Islamic eschatology can give that answer. No other branch of knowledge can give that answer. And this is why gold and silver is coming back as money. What do we do in the meantime? Answer, you make tawbah for what has happened in the past. You return to the Quran that the Quran might teach and guide and explain. You need methodology for studying the Quran and I've been trying to teach that methodology for two and a half weeks now. And you need to make a serious effort to try to get rid, get out of the paper money system and return to a market in which gold and silver coin can be used as money. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless your effort with success. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samir alim wa tuba alayna ya mawlana inna ka anta tawab rahim wa rahmatika ya ahmad rahmin. Ameen. It is also Salafi Sufi. It is also Deobandi Brelvi. <laughs> It's also Wahhabi Sunni <laughs> in South Africa. And in the Surao, I won't mention the name, around the corner around here. It's there as well. <laughs> Conflict right here of a sectarian nature. Do not, do not participate in sectarian warfare. No. The most important place that has to be preserved for Islam is the masjid. The masjid. And the way to get out of the sectarian conflict is to ensure that in the masjid nothing is allowed. Nothing is allowed. Except that which is firmly based on the Quran and the universally accepted sunnah. Universally accepted sunnah. I went to, I went to some masajid in Malaysia where you don't see women. I don't know. Put them in balcony, put them in the basement or put them in Annexo. But Nabi Muhammad والسلام, put the woman behind the men. In the masjid. If he had put the woman in front of the men, then no man would be able to perform the salat. <laughs> <laughs> so very very wisely, very wisely he put the woman behind the men. Makes a lot of sense, eh? Yes. But but he ordered the woman to remain longer in sijda than the men. 
Why? Because, he said, some of the men may not have enough cloth to cover themselves properly. Hmm? So, you should stay in Sijda longer so the men can come up and sit. Indicating, number one, that the women were behind them. No, sorry, women were in the masjid. Number two, that the women were behind the men in the masjid. Number three, that there was no barrier, no partition, no hijab between the men and the women. That the women prayed in the same space with the men. Hmm? Number four, that the space between the men and the women could become very small. Because he said the best row for the men is the first and the one with the greatest danger is the last. And the best row for the woman is the last and the one with the greatest danger is the first. Why? Because as the masjid falls, the last row of the men will be approaching the first row of the woman. And as men and women come close to each other, shaitan is ready to do his tricks. You see? So, you don't put women five miles behind the men. <laughs> That's what happened in the blue masjid a couple nights ago. I needed a binoculars <laughs> to find the woman. <laughs> it was so far away. But Blue Masjid has offered to host the session of only question and answers. And very kind of them to do so. But we will accept their offer on the condition that the woman be allowed to sit immediately behind the men. Please inform them of that. And so, in order to resolve the sectarian conflict, we insist that nothing be permitted in the masjid or the surah. Other than that which is firmly based on the Quran and the universally accepted sunnah. The universally accepted sunnah is that after the salams in salat, salams, salat is over. Salat is over. When salat is over, you better not disturb others. It's a very foolish thing to do. It's a very foolish thing to do to disturb another servant of Allah. That servant of Allah, Bismillah, excuse me. Is worried that maybe Allah will throw his salat back in his face. Because sometimes you are praying, but you're thinking about the durian in the fridge. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Sometimes you are praying and your mind strays and you are afraid that Allah might throw that salat back in your face. So when the salat is over, you want to make istighfar, seeking forgiveness from Allah. And you want to do it not only with your lips, you want to do it with your heart. And you don't want to be interrupted. But the Imam is making tazkirat loudly. It's a mechanic, like a machine operating now. It's like a machine operating, yeah. The machine works for so much after Salatul Maghrib. And you turn off the machine and make it look less time after Salatul Isha. And the machine has to work like this after Salatul Fajr. Like a machine. Tazkirat. Loudly. And all of us have to participate in it. It's not a part of the Sunnah. It's a Malay tradition. It's been there with the Malay for a thousand years. They're trapped in it. They cannot get out of it. No matter how they try, they will never get out of it. No. No. They're trapped in it. And yet I have to sit down there like a prisoner. 
because you are disturbing me. You are disturbing me. I don't want to hear your voice. The Salat is over. Why can't you leave me alone now? I want to make my private istighfar. I want to make my private tazkirat, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, privately, softly. I want to make dua from my heart to him. There's no need for collective dua. None. You make a collective dua when there is a cause for a collective dua. Huh? Like no rain. Like danger. Then you'll make a collective dua. But after every salat you have collective dua. Is this a machine? Huh? See? So in the Muslim village, the masjid or the surah will be different. No matter what may be the religious practice that you have, no matter how beneficial, no matter how long you practice it, we will not allow it unless it is based on the Quran and the universally accepted Sunnah. We say you could take it to your home, no problem. Take it to your private life. Do not bring it in the masjid and do not bring it in the public life of the village. In this way, the Sufi and the Salafi can live together. I have students who are Sufis and I have students who are Salafis. <laughs> yes, and they live together. The Sunni and the Shia can live together. The Wahhabi and the Shusunni can live together. If you follow this formula. Next question. Mazhab belongs to law. It is part of the beauty and the brilliance of the Islamic legal system that it has developed in this way. Not a monotonous, regulated, uniform <laughs> law but variety in the law and the law constantly evolving, emerging. Mm -hmm. And over time you have to choose one legal system for a particular community because you have one Qadi, one judge. So you choose one mazhab. Mm -hmm. But that does not mean that the others are not valid. Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah is reported to have said that if he goes to a masjid and the salat is being conducted according to the Hanafi mazhab, he performs his salat according to the Hanafi mazhab. In this way you avoid conflict between mazhabs. But the existence of a multiplicity of mazhab is not something negative. It is part of the beauty and billions of the law in Islam. Next question. When you give figures, you're only making plausible guesswork. You can be right, you can be wrong. But when I say 20, 25 years, it meant to me it's not going to be 250 years. Okay? It's just a broad estimate of how much more time we have left, inshallah. One of the one of the ways that you can recognize a great teacher is when his students are more learned than him. Hmm? And mashallah, some of my students are surprising me. They are contesting my view. <laughs> they are saying to me, you are of the opinion that a day like a month is now ending and a day like a week is now commencing. We are of the opinion that a day like a week is already here and is coming to an end. My students. <laughs> uh, I defer with them. I defer with them. Uh, uh, I say that Israel cannot be recognized 
as the ruling state in the world until there is this overt, overt, visible transfer of power. In the manner in which there was a visible transfer of power from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana. Visible, for example, when in 1944, in the Bretton Woods Accord, the sterling pound lost its status as the international currency and the US dollar replaced it. Visible for the whole world. Okay? That was 1944. And then in 1956, an event occurred which put the last nail in the coffin <laughs> for Britain. Jamal Abdel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. You were not born as yet, huh? in 1956 and Britain, France and Israel responded by invading and occupying the Suez Canal. They landed their troops and took control of the Suez Canal. The American President Dwight Eisenhower responded by ordering them out, ordering them out. And Britain had to put its tail between its legs and withdraw its troops. And so did France and so did Israel. As a consequence of that, the British government fell. The Prime Minister was Sir Anthony Eden and he had to resign. It was visible to the whole world that Britain is no longer the ruling state. Huh? So we need, we need events like these to occur which would visibly confirm that Israel has replaced the United States. That has not yet happened. The value of the gold does not increase. It is the value of the paper which is going down. So you must use the right terminology. Hmm? If you buy anticipating that the price will go down and you can then sell and make a killing, that is called a speculative transaction. And speculative transactions are haram. Hmm? But if market trend shows that this product is going to be in greater demand in the market and you buy this product then that is not speculation that is business acumen hmm? so a currency trader who trades anticipating that this one is going to collapse and that one is going to rise is engaged in speculative transactions and that's haram but buying gold at this time in order to preserve the value of your wealth that makes a lot of sense taking all your paper money and converting it to gold that makes a lot of sense whenever you need to reconvert it to paper because you need to buy and sell and you cannot use the gold then you can reconvert it and you'll not be making any profit. Oh no, is the value of the paper going down? You would have presented, pre preserved your value so you didn't suffer loss. It's not gain that you're getting, but rather you're not suffering loss. Next question. Yes. Why they're bringing back the gold and silver coins is not because they're people who are concerned with justice. That's not the reason. They're bringing back the gold and silver coins so that the Jal can convince the Jews that he is the Messiah. Yes, that's the reason. Electronic money has already replaced paper money and I was not even aware of it, really. 
I was waiting for the total collapse of paper and then the electronic will come but what I realized was that electronic, electronic money has already taken over the market and paper is only being used for micro transactions so we have already, ru we already moved to a new, new monetary system of electronic money how do you regulate this electronic money that is where they have to form sit down and form new policies and so on uh, but it's only going to be for a short time before they bring back gold and silver and then the jar will come uh, the sunnah in the lifetime of the prophet Allah's blessings be upon him was to give preference to dinar and dirhams and dinar and dirham are mentioned in the Quran as money not grain it is only when there was a shortage of dinar and dirham in the market that you would turn to commodities of food consumption which were in abundant supply in the market and which had a shelf life. Hmm? I don't know what you'd use in Malaysia.